let's start to talk about some interesting topics. The left traditionally presents, presented itself as an attempt to bring a better world along. They told us that we should live in equality, egalitarian society, we should share the wealth. It's beautiful. The right, on the other end, is an attempt, traditional right, I'm not talking about uh, Bush. The right, traditionally, was an attempt to tell us what the world is. So, when it comes to the debate between left and right, it would sound as follows. The right would tell the left, for instance, the leftists, it is really a beautiful idea that you try to make sure that we share everything and live in equality, but you must accept that people are not equal. I probably play saxophone better than most of you. <laughs> and I'm sure that Trevor is more advanced than you in guitar, and Corinna is a great singer. And I don't know you, but I'm sure that there are a lot of things. Huh? You play tenor sax. So, I'm, I, so we are probably better than the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I'm sure that many of you are better than myself in a lot of things. The right would tell the left to try to flatten the human landscape is actually inhuman. Because the most beautiful thing about this world is the true notion of diversity. The fact that women are more home-oriented and men are phys slightly stronger physically and could do manual work and so on and so on. For very many years, for more than a century, we wasted a lot of energy on this idiotic debate between left and right. But I'm going to introduce today a revolutionary way to examine the relationship between left and right. If left is there to tell us what the world is ought to be, and right is there to tell us what the world is, left is the dream, and right is the reality. The relationship between the dream and the reality is an exact reflection of the human condition. We are living between the real and the dream. You're a tenor player. You may dream that one day you'll wake up John Coltrane, <laughs> but you wake up <laughs> Coleman Hawkins. <laughs> well, that's fine. It's okay, I'm sure it's nice. <laughs> we are torn between the dream and the real. The magic of liberal democracy was that it facilitated such a, such a an reflection or mirror image between the political system and humanity. It's very unique. Do you remember Francis Fukuyama? Francis Fukuyama was a, 
an American political scientist who wrote in the late 80s, early 90s, a book about the end of history. He said, that's it. We found it. We found it. We know. Liberal democracy. Free market. This is what we need. There was a magic there. It worked. Back in the 70s and the 80s, we didn't think that the world was perfect, but we felt that there was kind of a continuum between us and the state, between us and the West. And things were wrong, but we felt that we knew how to repair them. This is why you had so many activists in America. To be an active activist was an attempt to fix the system. But Francis Fukuyama was actually very wrong. Because when he was writing his book, there was already a split, a devastating split between the humane and the politics. The political world started to drift away. Look at us now. There is zero reflection between who we are and government. We have been reduced into a bunch of consumers. And the role of government is simple, to facilitate consumption. For many years, it worked because we had credit cards. We were buying a lot of stuff, iPod, Schmipod, Nipod, Guypod, Zipod, with the money we believed we had. And one day, the bubble burst, and we realized that this game is over. And basically, we cannot buy anything anymore with the money we never had. But here is a problem. We are living in a free society. We are living in a free society. I mean, you regard yourself as a free society, don't you? No, I don't free. I'm, sometimes I'm slightly cynical. We are living in a free society and we have incredible universities. I guess that they are incredible because they cost so much money. <laughs> I don't know if somebody pays um, 50,000 a year for a course in calligraphy, it, it must be incredible. <laughs> we have incredible universities, incredible papers, incredible TV, so many news channels. And somehow, nobody was clever enough to tell us that the humane and government are splitting, drifting away. Look at production. You used to be the most productive state on this Planet, when is the last time you produced a, new, a good car? 60s. Ralph and I don't agree with that. Well, no. Anyway, you were a very productive country. Where was the left when production was kicked out of the window? Production is the most important thing. When I was a kid, all political parties were there to promise was work. Work is the most important thing. You wake up in the morning, you go to work, you produce something, you come home 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 
and you don't know that you're worth something. We had working class. Now all we have is workless class. Where was the left? Where was academia? Where was the press? When Detroit was reduced into Hiroshima. I tried to look into it and I realized that you couldn't think about it. You didn't find the, the words, the words to express your dismay. You were silenced intellectually, spiritually, and politically. How? Very simple. Political correctness. What is political correctness? Political correctness is a political standpoint that doesn't allow political opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is actually the definition of dictatorship. But dictatorship is much nicer. At least you know who is the dictator. You can gather in the pub, swear, do something. But in political correctness, it is you who censor yourself. Political correctness teaches you to lie. If I tell you, listen, it's politically incorrect what you just had in mind. <laughs> what I try to tell you is that you're probably right, but just keep it to yourself. By telling you keep it to yourself, I actually tell you, don't even ever think about it. I chop out, I castrate you. I castrate you. Political correctness teaches us to lie. It castrates us. It teaches us to think inauthentically. How is it possible that this process of correction was so vile and nobody understood the meaning of it? In fact, one person understood it. His name was George Orwell. George Orwell wrote in 1948 a very important book. It is called 1984. And he actually spoke about government, about elite, reducing our terminology. He spoke about Newspeak, about Brig Brother, castrating us by means of language. And then, George Orwell is something that each of you read in school. But they didn't tell you that it was about you. You thought that it was about Stalin. No, ladies and gentlemen. George Orwell didn't write about Stalin. He wrote about England. He wrote about the English-speaking empire. He wrote about England, about America, about the general dicta dictatorial tendencies within left thinking. And still, how did they do it to us?